Welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today, I'd like to carry on with more from my recent road trip to Los Angeles and hopefully get to a few viewer comments along the way. Let's begin with a look at some highlights of a couple of days I spent hiking around Hollywood. Hope you enjoy it. I'm here in Hollywood at the famous corner of Sunset and Vine. This is Vine Street running this way. Sunset goes that way. If you're in Dead Man's Curve, you come off the line here and go that way toward Doheny and then further on to Dead Man's Curve. But the reason I'm at this location is this is the site of the Beach Boys star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So there's the star. It was dedicated in a ceremony on December 30th, 1980. It's between B.P. Schulberg. I'm afraid I'm not sure who that is. Further on up is Dick Clark. If we come back this way, it's Spike Jones, and next to him is Quincy Jones. Apparently, what you need to do to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, it's a three-step process. You have to be nominated, which anybody can do. I'm sure often that's a publicist. Of course, you have to be approved, not that just anybody can get a star. You mainly have to pay the fee, which currently is $40,000. I believe it was like $3,000 around 1980. And if the recipient is living, they have to agree to show up for the dedication ceremony. So getting a star is probably not the most rigorous process. It's certainly not like qualifying for the Olympics or something, but there you have it. I thought you might like to take a look. I've moved further north up Vine Street and crossed the street to give you a view of the Capitol Records Tower. Important, of course, not only in the career of the Beach Boys and the Beatles, but many other important recording artists. And by virtue of its stack of records design, one of the most recognizable of Los Angeles landmarks. Thought you'd like to get a look at it? Let's continue our walking tour of Hollywood. While this is only peripherally Beach Boys related, I'm now standing outside the Princess Grace Apartments at 1801 Yucca Street, formerly the Hollywood Hawaiian Hotel. This is where Warren Zevon wrote Desperados Under the Eaves, which of course featured a guest vocal by Carl Wilson. We first discussed it in episode 205 featuring Carl Wilson part three. Thought I'd give you a little pan around, let you see what the area is like. I will say that Hollywood definitely seems to have improved a lot since I lived here in the mid late 80s. There's still some pretty scuzzy parts down on the boulevard, but they're making a real effort to revitalize the area and it really seems to be working. Overall, it's definitely much, much better than it was in the 80s and 90s around here. Anyway, thought you might find that interesting. I'm outside the Rock Walk at the Guitar Center at 7425 Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. I'm about a mile or a mile and a half west of Sunset and Vine where the Beach Boys star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame is. And if you were racing in Dead Man's Curve, at this point you would have already flown by La Brea. You'd have about another half mile to go to Schwab's and Crescent Heights. Schwab's of course isn't there anymore. Then you would continue on through the Sunset Strip and Beverly Hills for about nine miles until you finally came to Dead Man's Curve. The Rock Walk features handprints of some of the greats of rock and roll, including, I'm told, Brian Wilson. So let's take a look. Brian Wilson's handprints are not at all hard to find. They're about the third row in from the sidewalk. Dedication date is November 28, 1995, and he is between Buddy Guy on his right and on his left is Jan and Dean. I'll give you a better look at that. Let me just compare my hand size. Okay. But, boy, I guess Brian's hand's not too small. A little smaller than mine, I guess. We'll look around for some, uh, some more interesting ones to pass along. Here's George Martin, which is certainly notable. And also, man, look at the size of this guy's hands. I mean, I'm no, I'm no small guy. And look, he's got like spatulated fingers, like E.T. or something. Wow, that's amazing. And here's Little Richard with a dedication date of November 13th, 1986. I was actually here when Little Richard put his hands in cement. I read it was happening and came down just to see Little Richard. Glad I did. It was the only time I ever got to see him. He didn't perform, but at least I got to see the guy. Here's a neat one I wasn't expecting, the Wrecking Crew. You've got Hal Blaine, Glenn Campbell, Don Randy, and Carol Kay. Dedication shows June 25th, 
2008. Here's another kind of cool one. The Ramones dedicated August 6th, 1996. From left to right, you've got Johnny, Marky, CJ, and then in a nice touch, Joey is upside down. On the walls surrounding the handprints are plaques of dedication to some of the greats who passed away before their hands could be immortalized in cement. On this row, up at the top, We've got Keith Moon, certainly notable, and also notable for being a really poor likeness, I would say. What I've shown you is only a small fraction of the handprints that are on display. There's a lot of other greats, Chuck Berry, Stevie Wonder, Steely Dan, all the members of Cream, many, many more. This is a really worthwhile stop if you're a rock and roll fan. I'm sure you'll find it really interesting. I like the fact that with the handprints, it gives you something personal from the artist it's not just like seeing their name written on the sidewalk. So I would highly recommend this. And this area is certainly musical instrument central, this stretch of sunset. There's a big drum store over there. There's a place that specializes in horns around the corner, in addition to the guitar center behind me where the rock walk is. And I'm sure if our friend Chris Mari was here, he'd be able to tell me where to get a great bass nearby. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. We'll move on. I've stopped for lunch at the Hard Rock Cafe on Hollywood Boulevard because a couple of years ago, Burlington Bill, I believe it was, told me that one of Carl Wilson's guitars is on display here. You can see it in this Beach Boys display case, which is right over the doors to the kitchen near where I'm sitting. I'm gonna check it out a little bit in a moment. Just wanted to give you a lay of the land here and thank Burlington Bill for letting me know that this was here. Here's a better look at the display case. The guitar is inscribed Surfing USA at the Hard Rock Cafe, Carl Wilson. I just found this also at the Hard Rock Cafe. It says, this is a draft of a will written by Beach Boys patriarch, Murray Wilson. It is a window into Murray's well-documented neuroses. This screed is only a will in the broadest sense. Within the first 15 lines, it devolves into a diatribe about his wife, Audrey. We own a number of Murray Wilson documents, and they're all really disturbing, but this one is especially painful to read. Next to the Murray Wilson document is what is described as this is a drumhead signed by a recent incarnation of Dick Dale's road band. And above it is a photo of Jan and Dean from the cover of Take Linda Surfin'. I wonder if they think that's Dick Dale, I'm not sure. Anyway, thought that was kind of interesting. I have to say, I don't really think that Murray Wilson draft will fit in with the kind of stage outfits and autographed instruments that are on display in the rest of the Hard Rock Cafe, and I feel kind of ambivalent about it. I know it's been reproduced elsewhere. I know I've seen it. I'm sure you can find it if you're interested. Undoubtedly, documents like it give insight into Murray Wilson's character and are relevant for people interested in serious Beach Boys research. But I'm not sure that a personal document like that, framed and judged by the Hard Rock Cafe and put on display to anybody sitting there eating a cheeseburger is entirely fair. It's not really Beach Boys memorabilia. It has nothing to do with the Beach Boys career. It only seems to be there to publicly call Murray out for being a creep, and I'm not sure the judgment and public humiliation of a deceased person, especially one who is largely a private citizen, is really something that should be coming from a mid-priced, family-friendly chain restaurant. Whatever you might say about Murray Wilson, and you could say plenty, I'm not sure that this particular display can be justified without some version of two wrongs making a right. I'm not sure. Let me know if you have any thoughts or insights on that. As for Carl's guitar, I'm not a guitar guy, but I understand it's a 1966 Fender Jaguar. I mentioned Keith Moon being commemorated on the Rock Walk. John Hammond recently commented regarding the photo of Keith and Bruce Johnston in the new Beach Boys by the Beach Boys book, which I discussed with David Beard back in episode 216. That meeting between Keith Moon and Bruce is expanded on in the new Beach Boys Disney Plus documentary. John's comments reminded us of just what a huge Beach Boys fan Keith Moon was and that he covered Don't Worry Baby on his one and only solo album, Two Sides of the Moon, released in 1975. The track had also been released as a single A-side. 
I recently ran across an ad for it in the October 9th, 1974 issue of Billboard magazine. I thought this was pretty funny and pretty cool with Keith dressed as his version of a woody driving surfer. An alternate photo from the session appears on the album's inner sleeve. There's not much to recommend the single or the album. Over the years, it's become emblematic of bloated 70s rock star excess, with sessions just turning into big parties with time and money wasted on what essentially turned into a vanity project. It's been cited as a prime example of why we needed punk rock. Don't Worry Baby is clearly a labor of love for Keith, and I give him credit for retaining the original car lyrics, unlike some others who covered it. While I don't think there's much basis for calling Two Sides of the Moon a good album, I'm glad a Keith Moon solo album exists, and I think everybody would have expected that it was going to be pretty odd, to say the least. Of course, prior to joining The Who, Keith Moon had been in a band called Clyde Burns and the Beachcombers. Ron Chennery, a.k.a. Clyde Burns, says they played a lot of Shadows covers, plus the usual assortment of American rock and roll, and, quote, when the surf stuff came in, we did some Beach Boys and Jan and Dean songs, too. Keith transitioned out of the Beachcombers and into The Who in May of 1964. If he'd been playing Beach Boys songs with the Beachcombers, it strikes me that that would have made him one of the earliest UK fans, since the group didn't really break through in the UK until I Get Around became a hit in August. John Hammond's comments also reminded us that, at least occasionally, Keith Moon expressed a desire to quit The Who and join the Beach Boys. I'm not sure he was ever really serious about that. In fact, I'm not sure Keith Moon was ever really serious about anything. But he did MC a couple of Beach Boys shows and sat in with them a time or two. In any case, it's pretty hard to imagine Keith Moon and Mike Love existing in the same band. At the very least, I think that might have pushed TM to its limits. Getting back to my Los Angeles trip, in a stroke of good fortune, I happened to hear on the news one morning that a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame was being dedicated that day to Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons. I'd never been to a dedication ceremony before, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to at least get to see Frankie Valli. I knew I was closing in when I saw the sign on the Pantages Theater and spotted the crowd at 6150 Hollywood Boulevard, just east of Amoeba Music. The sidewalk was cordoned off to keep the public on the west side behind the podium with the press on the east side where they could get the best coverage. They started promptly at 11.30 a.m. After a quick introduction of the MC and some comments from the MC himself, who was interrupted several times by sirens on Hollywood Boulevard, Frankie Valley came on stage and then stood by while the MC made more comments. Irving Azoff came on stage and made a short speech. The MC then introduced Steve Terrell, who he was quickly informed either wasn't there or wasn't speaking. Frankie Valley was presented with a plaque and at one point turned to the crowd, which was one of the few times we got to see him face forward. Frankie Valley made his comments, then the MC returned to read a short statement from Bob Gaudio, who was unable to attend. After that, everybody moved around to the front of the podium to the star for more pictures for the press, and it was all over in about 20 minutes. I understand it was the 2,780th star since the walk began in 1958. Most of the comments at the ceremony centered around the Jersey Boys musical, which the event seemed set up to promote. Anyway, I had a great time in Los Angeles. I hope you enjoyed getting to see some of it. As I mentioned last time, I also went to a lot of record stores. I would say that there are probably more record stores in Los Angeles now than there were when I moved there in 1985. Of course, the big chain stores are gone, places like Tower on Sunset, but there are lots and lots of used indie stores, and I had a great time. I found nothing remarkable but some very cool stuff. One in particular I thought I'd share with you since it's peripherally Beach Boys related. I found this very minty copy of a net at Bikini Beach, released August 5th, 1964. It's got her versions of songs from the movie Bikini Beach, as well as the first release of Monkey's Uncle with the Beach Boys, which I formerly only had as a single. One of the things that really surprised me about the album is there's a track on it called Jamaica Ska. Even more surprisingly, the backing track sounds credibly like ska music. Nobody's going to mistake it for a Lee Scratch Perry record or anything, but Annette came a lot closer than I ever would have guessed. Anyway, I thought it's a beautiful record, and I'd love to know where it's been to have stayed in this kind of condition for 60 years.
Moving on, in episode 222, U.S. Pop Culture 1957, Part 5, I mentioned Bill Justice, whose big, twangy, guitar-led instrumental hit, Raunchy, went to number 3 in December 1957. Beanie pointed out that Bill Justice was actually the saxophone player in Bill Justice and his orchestra as they were billed at the time. The guitar was by Sid Manker, who co-wrote Raunchy, which was originally titled Backwoods with Bill Justice. I understand it was played using the bass strings instead of the middle strings with plenty of echo added by the song's producer, Sam Phillips. The rest of the orchestra was reportedly made up of the Sun Records house band. It's funny, the saxophone really is the featured instrument on Raunchy, but the guitar riff is so distinctive that it seems to be the thing most people notice about it, me included. That guitar riff also famously was what got George Harrison admitted to the group that became the Beatles. Paul got John to listen to George because he could play Raunchy perfect. He apparently did, and despite John's reservations about George being a little kid, he was allowed to join the band. Before we go, Martin Steele recently sent me a link to a performance by the South Vocal Ensemble of Council Rock High School South in Holland, Pennsylvania, in which the students perform Our Prayer and Heroes and Villains from Smile. It's a very cool performance, and I found it a real reminder of just how great great Beach Boys music is. I'll put that link in the video description here. I hope you'll check it out. Thanks, Martin, for letting me know about it. Next time, we'll return to our continuing series on featuring Carl Wilson. I hope you'll join me for that. I look forward to your comments on this. I hope you'll hit like and subscribe if you haven't. That helps raise our visibility here and maybe bring some more knowledgeable viewers into the conversation. So please do that if you don't mind. Have a great week. Thanks for watching. Bye.